Great. So I wanted to um, ask you, when you started working in the family business? I started working in the family business in 1995 after having... Because people should know that you haven't always been... You're a Swarovski, but you haven't always been at Swarovski, right? That's so there right. Was a yeah. I, you know, when people ask me how long I've worked for the company, I really have to say 37 years, inevitably. Right. <laughs> Without giving away my age. But... <laughs> Um, no, I did not um, go straight into the family business after university. Uh, my, my goal was really to find my own passion, to find my interest, to find my strength, and that was certainly within the art historic realm. Um, so after having studied art history, right. I did... Um, so you were an art history major, that's what... That's what and exactly. you were at an American university? Yes. Right. And then I uh, moved on into the art world. Was it Sotheby's? Was it Gagosian Gallery? And that eventually brought me on to Eleanor Lambert, right. the doyenne of American public relations right. in New York City, which was an amazing insight into the, the workings of the fashion industry. You know, just the interlinking, the designer relationships. Which designers were being represented by her at the time? Back then, well, El Eleanor Lambert actually started with Calvin Klein, Jeffrey yeah. Bean, Halston. Uh, we were working with Fernando Sanchez, and... Um, she famously created the best dress list, right? That's right, exactly. Right. And one of my tasks was to count those ballots. Right, okay. <laughs> A very ir interesting experience, especially to compare the ballot count and the final result. Okay. <laughs> um, Slightly differing. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. <laughs> So then what happened? What drew you back towards the, the family business? What drew you to back towards Swarovski? And you know, it was very fascinating to, for me actually to work for companies in New York City that were actually European family businesses in fashion, such as, for example, the Missoni family, the yeah. Trussardi family, Valentino. And it just made me think, well, hang on here. I come from a family business that is based in Europe, that has such a long heritage, and in fact, our root lies within the fashion industry. And it's exactly that element that, that has never been promoted within the world of Swarovski because at that time really our company and our brand name was only known for our consumer products which ranged... The figurines and... Exactly. Right. That's right. And it was actually the number one product that Swarovski has created was the jewelry stone right. which my great-great-grandfather created in 1895. He came from Bohemia which was an area indigenous to crystal cutting. And um, he developed a crystal cutting machine which would cut the crystals faster, more precisely, in greater quali quantity and quality. And you know, he just took this machine, moved to Austria, away from the competition, which ended up being a tremendous advantage for him because the Iron Curtain fell. And suddenly all of his competitors were in the Czech Republic in communism. And it really made him the world supplier of the crystal jewelry stone. So most people in America, while you were there at Gagosian Gallery, and most people's image of Swarovski was one of crystal figurines, and they didn't have no real understanding mm -hmm. that Swarovski had been supplying crystals um, to the movie business, to the fashion industry for a long time. I mean, there's been historically linked to fashion. There's been, um, you know, designers like uh, Christian Dior, Elsa Schiaparelli, all visited the factory in Austria. Um, people have been using it, but it had never been marketed to the fashion business. So tell me how, how that changed with you joining yeah. well, the company. I think um, <clears throat> the reason, first of all, why, why it never was marketed is because just at the beginning of that, the last century, you know, people weren't into branding, they weren't into marketing, yeah. but also because we had the monopoly of this jewelry stone supply. We didn't really feel the need to market our products, and thus the generic terminology of rhinestone, Strass, Haste, yeah. Diamante or Pierre Taillet du Tyrol, cut crystals of Tyrol, which is the reason, region that we're coming from in Austria. And um, I think just moving forward, you know, to the 80s, certainly there, there suddenly was competition in the crystal cutting process. More companies, you know, the, the sleeping giant, namely the Czech Republic, was waking up again, mm -hmm. was starting to cut crystals again, which certainly infused this need within Swarovski to market its products and actually start calling the product what it is, namely Swarovski Crystal <coughs> and not rhinestones. Because yeah, there was some great highlights in that, just to recap, there was uh, Marilyn Monroe's dress, 
uh, when she sang Happy Birthday, Mr. President. There was the ruby slippers from Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Um, there was Audrey Hepburn's tiara in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, so these are some of the classic archival moments from mm -hmm. uh, Swarovski supplying the um, costume industry in Hollywood and then influencing again um, popular culture, influencing the fashion industry back again, mm -hmm. um, and sort of creating that, that, that marketing cycle, if you like, um, and the relationship between glamour and crystals and diamonds and, and the whole sparkly world. of. Do you have any of that archive in your collection? Well, Do you own any of it? I did try to buy that Marilyn Monroe dress when she sang Happy Birthday, Mr. President. What was it, in auction? Or? Yeah, it was at Christie's, and it ended up going for $2 million, slightly <laughs> above my budget. So <laughs> we should have thought back in the 50s, you know. So that's what we're trying to do nowadays. You know, if we do place a product in a movie like Phantom of the Opera, we either have the dresses reproduced or we buy them from right. the costume set. You know, Are we're you actively trying to go back and reclaim part of your archive? Absolutely, right. yes. We've just hired an ar um, archivist. Right, okay. And, um, Fun job. Yeah. yeah, and it's just it's amazing to see also the positive reaction that we're getting from the various different fashion houses who truly appreciate this material within their own creations, you know. And just, to, just to um, recap with, the, with your role within the sort of bigger Swarovski company, mm -hmm. you're, you're in charge of what's called fashion components, right, which is the business to business. Your, your role as communications director is for business to business, so it's for the marketing and selling of the diamonds to the fashion industry and to the costume industry and the art world for use in creating products. It's not to you're not doing marketing to sell figurines or to sell optical lenses for telescopes or anything like that, right? That's right, okay. yes. So it's really you know, all about nurturing the relationships with those designers who will take our product and integrate it in a very creative way, be it the fashion industry, jewelry industry, architecture, design, art, as you said, and the music industry. So up until 10 years and ago, we called it rhinestone, we called it paste, now we call it Swarovski crystals, and now Alexander McQueen, Hussein Chalane are using it in really innovative ways in the catwalk. Um, how did that happen? What, what created that change? Well, it was certainly a very direct, um, integrative approach and communication with the designers. Uh, about 10 years ago, we did start an initiative to support young up-and-coming fashion designers. We felt it was very important at that time, you know, when you had these super mega brands that didn't leave any room for any small designers to even express their creativity. So our initiatives were twofold. We'll support their creativity, but we will also challenge them to use our product in a very creative and innovative way. It was who truly- was your, Who was one of the first examples Alexander of Alexander McQueen, right. uh, Philip what, Tracy, what kind of dates are we Julie McDonald in 1998. Right, when he was still showing that's in the UK, when he was still- That's right, right, in the UK, and there was one show in New York. Right. And then Philip Tracy, and then of course some American designers, right. such as Randolph Duke, for example, who at that time also monopolized the red carpet placements um, at the Oscars. Right. And Zach Posen, and it's amazing to see how some of the designers really truly have flourished and have created their own strong brands in the meantime. But it was really thanks to them, they reintroduced the crystal in the fashion industry in a very beautiful, hip, and modern way. And they created an inspiration to the rest of the industry to actually implement crystal in a beautiful way. And, you know, they went away from that Liberace connotation that Swarovski had, you know, the very superficial connotation or application of crystal onto surface. And this is really why the... How did that happen? How did Liberace get so swarovski up? Okay, well, that's another story. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Back to my grandfather who was sitting next to him on the airplane one day. And, um, Where was your grandfather? He was that was there. actually my great-great-grandfather. Oh, great, great he still has the okay. William mustache. But, um, so your great-great-grandfather was Daniel Swarovski? That's right. And your grandfather? Grandfather was Manfred Swarovski. Pardon? Manfred. Manfred, right. So he was a tremendous inspiration to me. In a sense, you know, he was the one who was working with Coco Chanel and Christian Dior directly, Elsa Schiaparelli. They developed certain stones and colors. And, you know, I just felt that direct communication with the designers is missing nowadays, and we need to capitalize on exactly that type of relationship. So that's what we're doing nowadays. Um, so I was just, I was copying my grandfather. But he was also very inspirational. Back to Liberace, um, he sat next to him on the airplane one day and was so fascinated by this man and said, for you, free crystal for the rest of your life. 
And Liberace truly took him up on that offer. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandfather once Hence took me the to car, Liberace. The everything, the cupboards, yes. yeah. The car, the piano. So my grandfather took me to a concert in New York, and I just thought, my gosh, there has to be a better way. <laughs> We're going to find that better way. <laughs> and How do you judge which designers you're going to work with and which you're not? I mean, you must get approached by loads of young designers to sponsor yes. shows. Nowadays we do. I have to mention at the beginning it was very hard. People didn't even want to talk to us. And right. um, it did take a lot of convincing to bring people into the showroom, to show them the product. But um, once we really presented the product to them, they realized, my gosh, this is just one other creative ingredient in their final work. Why do you think people were so resistant to you at the beginning? Perhaps it was because of the existing connotation. Yeah you know, and the stereotyping of a certain product that Swarovski created, which, you know, is only a m half of because the Because of your brand image, basically. And now your brand image is different. Mm -hmm. You're in a whole different situation yeah. with designers. So what, how do you judge? So um, we with? really, we look at the past track record of the, desi of the designers. Um, we really see how they've worked with different materials, their appreciation towards different materials. Um, truly their passion, their passion for fashion and um, the willingness to want to work with the product. And you can feel that right away. If somebody appreciates the product, inevitably they will use the crystal in a beautiful way. And, um, do they sketch for you ideas before yeah, you go forward? Yeah, they usually do bring us their sketches. Right. Yeah. And sometimes you can also tell perhaps the passion is not so much there, but they do approach us for the money. and. You know, it never works. That equation never works. It, you know, crystal then is just a last, you know, thought of the entire creation, and it doesn't look good. And should we see some of the examples of sure. young designers working with, or not so young, but you know, talented, non-mega brand designers working with your? Yeah, and we crystal. really, it's it's always a personal relationship. It's always a very or personal careful with you, or yes, with other people. Yes, with, with other myself people. Right. and with the entire team. And with the product, eventually. What I did was use the chandelier crystals uh, with angular cutting to really symbolize like a new modern form of heirloom jewelry. We thought of beading pieces because we could simulate kind of the coralline um, aesthetic. And it creates a sheen and things that, you know, you can create shapes with crystal. You can do things that look like they're coating something. There really aren't any limitations. There were a lot of these kind of dry, heavy felts that were very matte. And it just seemed like the perfect juxtaposition to kind of pair them with these very shiny, sparkly crystals. Got these really amazing buttons made from the chatons. They really just blow the light right back at you. And it just is quite blinding, but in a really great way. So, um, you know, these relationships are so important for us. Or this exercise of um, sponsoring young designers because they take products that have been our, in our assortment for about a hundred years, but reinterpreted in a completely different way, and uh, position the product in ways that we never would have dreamed of. You know, we're too close to the tree. We, we only see the bark, we don't see the full picture anymore, so to have that outside point of view is absolutely refreshing and vital.